Hi everybody, thank you for uh, coming to my channel. This is my new channel, Out of the Shadows of Shame. And to start, um, I'm going to be making a series of videos that deal directly with the issue of child sexual abuse um, and specifically pedophilia and family incest. Um, and in order to kind of get an idea of where we are today in 2017, we have to kind of go back and do a little history lesson. Uh, what I'm going to show you at the end of this video hopefully will tie together with what I'm showing you now. Um, so to begin, uh, I want to talk to you about False Memory Syndrome Foundation. What it is, how it started, um, and how it is still affecting us today. So again, like I said, this is a bit of a history lesson. I'm going to go through a little bit of this family story to show you where False Memory Syndrome Foundation started, who its members are, and a little bit about their background. Some of the things they probably aren't that comfortable with sharing with the general public, but it will give you, hopefully, an idea of who these people are, what their motivations are, and why in my opinion, they are not to be trusted. So this, to start here, is a blog post, obviously, by Katie Butler. She is a, a journalist, and uh, this was, uh, as you can see, posted in 1995. So I'm going to read a little bit of this blog post, and then I'm going to go around uh, to some of these other tabs that I have open so that I can show you uh, how all of this ties together. So this says, in less than three years, the False Memory Syndrome Foundation has catalyzed a national debate about therapeutic accountability, denial, and the nature of memory. But it began with a painful dispute within a single family, that of Pamela and Peter Fried of Philadelphia and their daughter, Jennifer, of Eugene, or Oregon, over a shared and equivocal past. Their account of their once private difficulties is contained in two documents. The first, by the mother, Philadelphia educator Pamela Fried, was published anonymously in October of 1991 in a small circulation Minnesota journal called Issues in Child Abuse Accusations. It was entitled, How Could This Happen? Coping with a False Accusation of Incest and Rape. Now, what's interesting here is I'm going to show you something real quick. This post was a Facebook post written by William Fried, who is the brother of Peter Fried. Peter Fried is the husband of Pamela Fried, who we were just reading about. If you'll notice here, it says, and you can go down, and I will link all of this in the description, you can read this letter from the brother of Peter Fried. This was actually a letter that was submitted to Congress regarding a movie called Divided Memories, and this Divided Memories was based off of information obtained from the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. But if you look right here at the top, the very first paragraph, it says Peter Fried, in his statements in support of the fact that his daughter grew up in a very abusive home, that he is in fact married to his stepsister, Pamela Fried. So it's interesting that she is talking here about incest. Okay, so. The second was delivered by a speech by her daughter, cognitive psychologist Jennifer Fried, at a mental health conference in Ann Arbor, Michigan in the summer of 1993, more than a year after her mother and her father founded the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. In that speech, later republished in a small newsletter for incest survivors, Jennifer Fried said, I remember incest in my father's house. By all accounts, the trouble among the Frieds began or surfaced a week before Christmas in 1990, when Jennifer Fried went to her second therapy session with a PhD-level licensed clinical psychologist who was part of a medical group in Eugene, Oregon. Fried, who was 33 and married with two children, she was also a tenured research professor at the University of Oregon, a former fellow of the Guggenheim and National Science Foundations, and an expert on memory. A colleague had described her as a tough cookie. But she didn't seem so tough in the therapy office, speaking of agitation at her parents' impending Christmas visit and a lifetime of unease, uneasiness with her father. During the session, her therapist asked her if she had a history of sexual abuse, and she said no. 
but later that evening, according to a carefully researched account by Stephen Fried, a different Fried, by the way, if you'll notice the spelling, in January of 1994 issue of Philadelphia Magazine, she found herself trembling, overwhelmed by intense and terrible flashbacks of male genitals. Her agitation continued until two evenings later when her parents, Peter and Pamela, a brilliant and unconventional mathematician who had entered a treatment center for alcoholism in the early 1980s, arrived for Christmas. Over chicken dinner that night, Jennifer Fried later said that her father talked at length in front of her young children about how lesbians use turkey basters to inseminate themselves. A conversation that Pamela Fried the mother, grandmother, saw as nothing more than good-humored and open family discussion. That night, Jennifer Fried found herself so inexplicably afraid for the safety of her children that she asked her husband to sleep outside the children's bedroom door. The next morning, she and her family fled the house. Her husband later phoned the elder Frieds and asked them to take a cab to the airport and go home. Uh, he told uh, Jennifer told her husband that she had remembered being seriously abused by her father. And he says, I have no memory of that, said Peter Fry, according to Philadelphia Magazine. Either I'm psychotic or she's under someone's control. Not long afterward, Jennifer, at her distressed parents' urging, but against her therapist's express advice, sent her father via email an account of vivid recollections of abuse ranging from a molestation in the bathtub at age three or four to rape at age 16, and she suggested that her parents read The Courage to Heal. She also began for the first time in her life to question what she saw as a lifelong family pattern of sexualized conversations and invasiveness. She said that she had told about 20 friends about her memories of abuse, including her children's teachers and many of the people that the elder Frieds had met on previous visits to Eugene. To Pamela, who believed her husband's denials almost immediately, the changes in her formerly affectionate and compliant daughter amounted to a shocking and frightening personality change. She and her husband consulted her former psychiatrist, Dr. Harold Leif, who suggested Peter Fry take a lie detector test and came to believe the elder Frieds. I think that's a typo there. Pamela also went to the library, read the literature of the incest recovery movement, and became convinced that her daughter had manufactured false incest beliefs throughout exposure to suggestive self-help book, self books and a trigger-happy therapist. Uh, it went from bad to worse in the, um, let's see, so this is interesting here. She says, things went from bad to worse. The elder Frieds fruitlessly offered to fly Jennifer's therapist to Philadelphia to show her tapes of the lie detector test and other evidence that they said demonstrated Peter's innocence. Meanwhile, Jennifer told her paternal uncle and her sister, both of whom, paternal uncle, by the way, is the one that wrote that uh, letter there on Facebook that I just showed you, um, and both of whom believed and supported her. Jennifer has been quoted as saying that her sister, referring to their shared childhood, responded to her disclosures by saying, so that's why you had all those locks on your door. Um, and that fall, against the express advice of Dr. Leif, an anguished Pamela Fried anonymously published her side of the family story as Jane Doe. She said she could continue loving her daughter by regarding her as temporarily deranged. She blamed her daughter's therapist for what Jennifer reported as memories. And in her search for psychological stresses that might have generated what she thought were delusions, she questioned Jennifer Fried's academic productivity and inaccurately said that her daughter had left an earlier university job after being turned down for tenure. So there's a little bit of untruth there going on, it looks like. In fact, Jennifer Fried had left one university after being refused a decision on early tenure and had gone to the University of Oregon because it offered her tenure at 29. In the article, Pamela Fried also revealed intimate details that her own grown daughter had confided to her about her first marriage, her present marital life, her experiences with breastfeeding, her teenage drag experimentation, and her college-age anorepia. Nothing in the article revealed Jennifer Fried's identity, the daughter, but in the course of the next year, as Pamela solicited support for her fledgling False Memory Syndrome Foundation, 
she sent her article to mental health professionals all over the country and spoke to the press, sometimes identifying herself as Jane Doe. Four of Jennifer Fried's departmental colleagues at the University of Oregon received copies of the article while she was being considered for promotion to full professor, two of them from Pamela Fried directly, one anonymously, and one from a research psychologist who had become a member of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation Board. So um, it's interesting that they would attack her as an individual, as a professional, and they would attack her credibility in the expert field of memory. Um, and it goes on to say that, that Pamela Fried continued to contact the press, um, and that's when a stream of, of coverage began. More parents began calling after the New York Times published an article headlined Childhood Trauma, memory or invention. And then in 1993, the San Francisco Examiner published a six-day front page series called Buried Memories, Broken Families. And then Time later published Lies of the Mind. Now, what I want to show you is here, this is a um, this is a very well researched and a very highly footnoted article here. Um, and it talks about the creation of this false memory syndrome foundation. It kind of jumps all over the place. It's talking about a report here. Um, but what I want to highlight is that these false memories are supposedly created by unscrupulous and unethical therapists who they are claiming implant memories of sexual abuse and trauma. Um, this is very interesting if you read the entire article here because it talks about um, the prevalence of sexual abuse, especially in families. Um, it says false memory syndrome has been described as a widespread social phenomenon where misguided therapists cause patients to invent memories of sexual abuse. The syndrome was described and named by the families and professionals who comprise the False Memory Syndrome Foundation, an organization formed by parents claiming to be falsely accused of child sexual abuse. Proponents of the syndrome claim that it is occurring at epidemic levels and some have gone so far as to characterize it as a mental health crisis of the 1990s. Critics, on the other hand, have suggested that the syndrome is based on vague, unsubstantiated generalizations which do not hold up to scientific scrutiny, and that the syndrome's primary purpose is to discredit victims' testimony. The article critically exclaims, or excuse me, critically examines the assumptions underlying the concept to determine whether there is sufficient empirical evidence to support false memory syndrome as a valid diagnostic construct. Epidemi Epidem I can't say this, epidemiological, sorry, evidence is then examined to determine whether there is data to support the claims of either a public health crisis or an epidemic. Um, so it, sh it says two constant findings have emerged from the research. The problem is widespread and child abuse is extensively undisclosed and underreported. Um, that comes from the National Clearinghouse on Family Violence published in 1997. Um, it says, when reported, child sexual abuse is extremely difficult to prosecute and few perpetrators are ever brought to justice. Despite uh, research showing that children rarely confabulate or create stories of abuse, offenders often convincingly argue that their accuser has falsely accused them. In addition, the legal system has historically viewed children as the property of their parents and professionals have discounted women's reports of incestuous abuse as wishful fantasies. As a result, legal and mental health professionals have tended to be overly suspicious and unresponsive to reports of sexual abuse. In the 1980s, some incest victims attempted to hold their abusers accountable by seeking compensation in court for abuse-related injuries. Um, and it says most state laws consider sexual abuse to be personal injury which tends to have short statute of limitations. Consequently, actions are generally time barred by a victim's 19th or 20th birthday, an age where most people are still dependent upon their parents. Um, let's see, um, let's, I want to 
find here, uh, let's see, accused parents, many of whom were affluent and respected members of the community, sought out defense lawyers and psychological experts for help in defending against abuse-related claims. A new concept, false memory syndrome, was advanced by parents and professionals as an alternative explanation for delayed memories of sexual abuse. And in March of 1992, the False Memory Syndrome Foundation was founded. It says founders leaders Peter and Pamela Fried were motivated because their adult daughter privately accused Peter of sexually abusing her as a child. They were put in touch with other parents claiming to be falsely accused by Dr. Harold Leif, who was later revealed to be Pamela's personal psychiatrist. Families were also referred by Dr. Ralph Underwager and Halida Wakefield, a husband and wife team who are prominent advocates for people accused of molesting children. A frequent defense expert witness, Underwager's philosophy concerning the prosecution of child sex abuse has not been summed up by, the, I'm sorry, excuse me, has been summed up by the statement that it is more desirable that a thousand children in abuse situations are not discovered than for one innocent person to be convicted wrongly. It says Underwager and Wakefield were also instrumental in helping the Frieds organize the foundation. The original toll-free number for the foundation rang at Underwager's Private Institute for Psychological Therapies, and Underwager and Wakefield developed the initial questionnaire used to survey the families who contacted the foundation. Now, it's interesting to note that Dr. Leif also treated Oh, excuse me, this is the wrong one here. Um, I'm sorry, let me go back here. Uh, Dr. Leif also was the psychologist that treated Peter Fried for his alcoholism. What caused him to seek treatment for his alcoholism, he said, was that he claimed his memory was not what it used to be. Now note, that treatment for alcoholism was in the early 1980s, a full 10 to 12 years prior to this taking place with the false memory syndrome and him saying about his own daughter that either he doesn't remember and he's crazy or she's under someone else's control. So I think that's interesting to note. Also, the fact that someone who claims to be an expert on the idea of incest are two people who were stepbrother and sister who ended up marrying each other. That's very interesting. So um, it talks about here the false memory syndrome, how it um, developed a resource center and a database for legal cases involving repressed memories. Um, this goes into the evaluation of how it is, how this was all constructed. They define false memory syndrome. It says it did not evolve from clinical studies, but rather the purported syndrome's description is based on the accounts of parents claiming to be falsely accused of child sex abuse. However, those parents, in many cases, had previously been convicted of child sex abuse, which is interesting to note, and none of these uh, board members did any research on these parents when they claimed that they were all members of this sin of this foundation who had been falsely accused. Um, I also want to note here, uh, let me see, I don't know if I can find it quickly while we're talking. Uh, this goes into how the, how it all started with the letters and the Jane Doe of Pamela Fried and how she basically went after her uh, daughter. Oh, here it is. This is very interesting. Jennifer Fried um, also revealed that her father was a chronic alcoholic throughout her childhood and had himself been sexually abused as a boy by an older man, a fact that he seemed to take pride in. According to Jennifer, he frequently described himself as been, having been a kept boy. She also noted that her abuse memories were consistent with never forgotten memories of her family's pattern of sexualized and intrusive behavior. Um, memories which Peter and Pam have for the most part confirmed. Uh, let's see. Um, Jennifer also noted that her only sibling, a sister, was already estranged from her parents at the time that these allegations were made. In addition, Peter Fried's own mother 
who is Pamela's stepmother and his only sibling, um, and his only other real sibling, a brother, were also estranged from Pamela and Peter. It should be noted that these family members support Jennifer's side of the story, and in a statement, Peter's brother, William, stated that there is no doubt in my mind that there was severe abuse in the home of Peter and Pam. The False Memory Syndrome Foundation is a fraud designed to deny a reality that Peter and Pam have spent most of their lives trying to escape. Very interesting to note. Uh, let's see, to date, no empirical validation has been offered for false memory syndrome as a diagnostic construct, nor have the symptoms that characterize this putative syndrome ever been systematically described and studied. As a result, false memory syndrome has never been accepted as a valid diagnosis by any professional organization, and usage of the term has been the subject of heated criticism in peer-reviewed scientific journals. For example, 17 behavioral scientists co-authored a statement objecting to the term false memory syndrome as a non-psychological term originated by a private foundation whose stated purpose is to support accused parents. Critics have suggested that the syndrome is based on vague, unsubstantiated generalizations which do not hold up to scientific scrutiny, as we've said before. Um, False Memory Syndrome Foundation members paradoxically claim to place great value on scientific inquiry while permitting their syndrome to remain so vaguely defined that it is virtually impossible not only to study it, but to determine who suffers from it. Um, let's see, there's also all different kinds of social constructs that they take a look at as to whether or not it's you know, a false memory, a real memory. Um, but I just think it's interesting to note that Peter Fried is the one who himself claimed to have a poor memory, that which would push him into alcohol rehab, uh, and yet he is pointing the finger at his daughter, saying that she's the one who doesn't remember correctly. Let's see. Um, if you go all the way down here, this talks about the data. Let's see. Okay, careful examination of the false memory syndrome reporting practices revealed that contact and membership figures reported to the public were unaccountably var variable. In addition, membership figures quoted to the public often were highly inflated over the actual figures reported to the IRS during the same time period. For example, in early 1994, the Sacramento Bee reported that Pamela Fried said her foundation had 11,000 members including health professionals and lawyers. In an article ironically titled, Ethical Issues in the Search for Repressed Memories, False Memory Syndrome Foundation advisor Harold Mursky reported, the False Memory Syndrome Foundation has grown rapidly with over 12,000 members by early 1995 and with more than 21,000 listed inquiries. In, in April 1995, Ofra Bickle's frontline documentary, Divided Memories, which I mentioned before, which relied heavily on the False Memory Syndrome Foundation for information, reported that the foundation had 15,000 members. Toward the end of 1995, False Memory Syndrome Foundation newsletter suggested that the organization was over 17,000 strong. Oops, excuse me. These figures significantly larger than those reported to the IRS for 1995. The, fa the False Memory Syndrome Foundation reported that by the end of 1995, they had 2,385 members, a portion of who were professionals rather than families. Although the problem of inaccurate membership figures being reported to the public was brought to Pamela Fried's attention in 1995, inflated figures continued to be a problem. As Table 1 demonstrates below, in 1996, the average membership figure reported to the public was approximately six times higher than the figure reported to the IRS. Here they are. These are obtained from 990 tax forms filed with the IRS. So, let's just establish here that it sounds to me as if there seems to be a problem with stretching the truth. So now we're going to talk about Dr. Underwager, who they had on their advisory board and who they said gave uh, uh, expert testimony in these cases of child sex abuse. Let's go take a look 
but an article in a Dutch publication called the Padika Interview. The Padika papers uh, are um, a pedophile friendly publication. Let's take a look. Here is his, uh, Dr. Underwager did a um, interview, he and his wife, Hallida Wakefield. Uh, let's see. He's talking about pedophile literature. Um, he says, there are pedophiles that I have come to know to talk with as patients while providing treatment, but my contacts have not been limited to the therapeutic setting. I've also met others in the general context here in the Netherlands and in the U.S., and I've read some of the literature. So what he's saying is, is that he um, moves in social circles, it sounds like, uh, outside of therapeutic settings where he has constant contact with people who identify as pedophiles. He says, let me give you another example. The pedophile literature keeps talking about relationships. Every time I hear the word relationship, I wince. It's a peculiar, peculiarly bloodless, essentially Latin word that may have a lot of intellectual or cognitive context, but it has a little emotion. I think it would be much more honest to use the good old Anglo-Saxon four-letter word, love. More honest for pedophiles to say, I want to love somebody, not I want a relationship. I mean, what the hell's a relationship? Let me step away from this interview here for a minute. Why would you want to love someone outside the context of a relationship? Because if there isn't a relationship, it's not really love, is it? It seems more like lust to me, but I digress. Uh, let's see. Um, so here he goes on to say, pedophiles can make the assertion that the pursuit of intimacy and love is what they choose. With boldness, boldness, they can say, I believe that this is in fact part of God's will. Excuse me while I vomit on my shoes. So here the interviewer is saying to him, so you say that pedophiles should affirm the fact that they believe that pedophilia is part of God's will? Are you also saying that for the pedophile to make this claim about God's will is also to state what God's will is? is? And he replies laughing, of course I'm not privy to God's will. I do believe it is God's will that we have freedom. I believe that God's will is that we have absolute freedom. No conditions, no contingencies. When the blessed apostle Paul says all things are lawful for me, he says it not once but four times. All things are lawful for me. And he also adds that not everything works. And again, let me stop this interview right here because that is not what the apostle Paul said. The Apostle Paul said that we do have freedom. He was talking about, um, in this context, eating food that was sacrificed to idols. And he was saying that if you are not believing in idol worship, you don't have to be bothered by your conscience that eating this food that was sacrificed to an idol is somehow going to defile you. But what he did say was that, yes, all things are uh, lawful because you're not under the, the um, Mosaic law of, of the Hebrews back in, in those days. Um, but it says that not all things are good for me, which means just because you have the freedom to eat that food that is sacrificed to an idol doesn't mean you should take that liberty. So let's just clear that up. So then Halida Wakefield, the wife, the interviewer says, I can see that you want to say something. Do you have a different point of view? And she said, I would add one qualification to what Ralph has been, has just said about there being no conditions or contingencies to the freedom given to us by God. I would add, you have to take the consequences of this freedom. That said, well, I guess I do feel differently about some things. For example, I find it difficult to envision how a pedophile relationship can have the potential of being the type of close, intimate, constantly developing relationship that would be possible in more traditional relationships, whether in heterosexual marriages or a committed adult homosexual relationship. Speaking only about men and boys, at least, what I have seen is that once the young man gets to be a certain age, the pedophile is no longer interested in the young man sexually. These relationships started around age 11 or 12, or even younger, 
And then by 1617, the pedophile is ready for a new one. That doesn't sound very loving to me, does it? The old relationship is, if not thrust aside, at least radically changed. It's hard for me to see that this is a deep, meaningful relationship, even if I'm using a word that Ralph doesn't like. She says, I'm no expert on the way these relationships develop or what happens to them when the boy turns 17 or 18. I can't imagine it just stays the same. It poses certain questions for me. Do pedophiles retain a close, intimate relationship with the boy, although the sex <coughs> rape ends? Did they then add another boy while keeping the first boy and then later repeat the pattern and add another and just keep adding new boys until they have an entire harem, ranging in age from, let's say, 12 to 40? Or perhaps the pedophile doesn't keep the first boy around. Perhaps he disappears out of his life altogether, only to be replaced by the next. And if that's the way it is, which seems from my observation to be the case, then I don't understand how there can be a close, intimate, constantly progressing and developing relationship. Perhaps it is possible. I'm not saying it's not. But it does strike me as being a limitation of these relationships. Also, they're saying here that another problem is that, at least in the United States, pedophilia is viewed so negatively that I think the possibility of harming the young man would be very real. I don't know if a positive model is available in the United States. The climate is such in the United States that it would be very, very difficult for a pedophile, even with the most idealistic of motives and aspirations, to make his relationship actually work in practice. Oh, because maybe he should go to prison? Okay. And then she goes on to say, even if the boy at some point viewed it as positive, so largely they don't, it sounds like, after coming into contact with the way the society as a whole viewed it, the very real danger would be created of making the experience harmful. Relationships and societal attitudes are, of course, two completely different areas, and in such a negative climate, I don't know if it would be possible for the relationship to be good for the parties involved when the entire society is so negative. Okay, so, now, they are victims, not of a pedophile, not of a predator, not of a person who wants to create an entire harem of young boys. They are a victim of a negative society who just doesn't understand love. That's what they're saying. <laughs> Excuse me. Again, I'm going to throw up on my shoes. If you'd like to see, <laughs> here's an interesting, um, I can't show it because of copyright reason, but I will just show you the beginning of what it looks like. This is the witness for Mr. Bubbles. This was a documentary done in Australia about a case in which Dr. Underwager testified for the fee of $25,000 against the accusers of a man who repeatedly abused children in a bathtub, hence the nickname Mr. Bubbles. This is a great uh, video. It's 23 minutes long. I will put it in the description so you can take a look. Um, also, let me go back here to the Padaika interview. In the very beginning, Ralph Underwager, there he is. There's his wife. Aren't they sweet? Yes, he talks about that pedophilia and homosexuality are learned behaviors. So if they're learned behaviors and uh, Peter and Pamela Fried were experts on incest and they were brother and sister stepsister married to each other and Peter was a kept boy as a child who sort of bragged about it and then he said he didn't have any memory and that's why he had to go to alcohol treatment but then his daughter who was an expert on memory he said she didn't remember things correctly uh, okay I'm just trying to follow along here yeah, I'm not following. This here is a copy of, this is a documentary, it's a two-part series uh, done by Anna Salter, um, and this is about sexual predators and the techniques that they use to gain victims and also how to fight the system when they're caught and how they systematically discredit the accusers by being upstanding citizens in society 
that guy that you see there in that picture, he was an assistant deacon pastor at a church. That was great. So, um, this is also some recollections of Jennifer Fried. She said that she and a friend once danced nude for her father, Peter Fried, when they were nine or ten. During her childhood, her father discussed how he had been sexually abused by a gay man. Once, when their dog began to rub against a visitor, he explained that the dog was reflecting the daughter's sexual interest in the guest. Oh, but Peter Fried said he had no memory of the dancing. The episode with the family pet could have happened, but only in the context of innocence. And yes, he had discussed his past as a kept boy, but only to maintain a healthy atmosphere of openness. So, um, yeah. Then they go in to talk about um, the people who are now coming forward and how they've had horrible therapy and all of those things. That's really... Uh, great because uh, again they're blaming the therapist uh, without looking at the um, accused and the behavior there. I'm going to stop for just a second so I can collect a few of uh, a few more items and move on to the next piece of this video. I just don't want to lose the recording I have here, so give me just a minute and I'll be right back. Okay, so I'm back, and uh, here is what I want to show you today to bring you up to speed. Uh, these are some screenshots that I'm going to show you of what I found, someone who is very active on Twitter. She has multiple profiles, and her name is Barbara Hewson. And again, this is information that I have found easily available, uh, published by her, uh, and articles by her that I'm going to show you. Um, by this woman, Barbara Hewson. She is a barrister. Here's the first picture here. Let me see if I can get this to come up. Okay. So, if you look here, these are her hashtags. False memory, pseudo-victims, falsely accused, rape culture. This is one of her Twitter profiles. You can see here underneath it says at Barbara Hewson. I don't know what this means. It's probably some Latin word or Greek word or something. I'll have to figure that out. If you look here, she's written a book called The Compensation of Being a Victim. Nice. And also here is, uh, this is spiked online here. And what she's got here is called The Tyranny of Believe the Victim. We'll get to that in a minute. Here's another profile by Barbara Hewson. She says that she's here. She's a barrister, leading barrister. Um, these tweets are protected. She's got 465 followers here. Here's a picture of her. Uh, and she's saying that rape victims have a moral responsibility. Uh, we'll get to that in just a minute. Again, here's another picture of her. She says she's a banker, a lawyer, international development investor, and a medical administrator. She has two daughters. Okay, so she's also anti-Trump, apparently. Um, whatever that has to do with any of this, I don't know. So this shows here, this person, she was do this person lives in the UK and was doxxed, publicly outed with name, phone number, address, and all sorts of things by this barrister. And this person, Sunny Clarabel, on Twitter is very active in exposing uh, stories of pedophilia. So, oops, sorry, let me go back here. Let's go to the first. Well, there you go. Now you get to see <laughs> my uh, screenshot there. Let's see. I'm trying to get back to... There we go. This is a screenshot of the first part of that article that I was talking about. And it says, this was written in 2016, which is very interesting because this is around the exact same time that the WikiLeaks came out and uh, John Podesta's emails were revealed, which is a whole other subject for a video that I will not go into today because this one is already long enough. She says, in recent years, UK institutions have been beset by lurid claims about VIP pedophile rings. This mythology of powerful perverts preying on children has gained extraordinary traction. 
once an idea put about by conspiracy crackpots like David Icke, who claims that human sacrifice and ritual abuse are rampant. It has been taken up uncritically by some politicians and investigative journalists, presumably because it suits their ideological needs. So I'm going to go, I will let you read the article, but at the very bottom of this article, she says clearly, it is time to slaughter the sacred cow of, quote, believe the victim, end quote. And she says that the reason for that is because it goes against the idea of you are innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. Now, let me just point something out here. If we think critically about that, the court itself, the judge or the jury, are to be the ones who presume the innocence until they are proven guilty. That is not for investigators and doctors and other people who might represent a victim to assume that the accused is actually innocent. And I'll prove that to you by saying when you call and report that your car was stolen by a man wearing a red jacket, the cops are not going to pull over a man in a red jacket who's driving the exact same car you just reported stolen and let him go and say, well, we are assuming that you are innocent until proven guilty. That's not the way it works. So she is hoping that she's going to be able to give you that impression and hope that you don't look a little bit deeper and think a little bit more critically about what's being said here. She's hoping this is just going to gloss right over the top of you and you're going to go on about your day and shake your head at those poor falsely accused people. And when you look at folks that push this false memory syndrome, the ones who initiated the entire foundation and you look at their lack of credibility, I'm very curious to know the motivation of someone who is a barrister in the UK and a, apparently an educated and informed individual, why they would still jump on this bandwagon of false memory syndrome foundation when it's been highly discredited. And if you were to watch the uh, YouTube clip there of that uh, Mr. Bubbles tape, uh, you'll see how they completely discredited Dr. Ralph Underwager. So, so much so that when he was giving an interview inside his own home, he stood up and threw the journalists out the door because he was so upset and could not answer very direct and very specific questions. So it's interesting to know. Um, I, I have so much more that I want to share with you on this subject. Uh, I can't fit it all into a, any more of this video. I think, I think it's time for me to end this video and I will move on to the next, the next video that I'm going to do in detail regards uh, them, them, the officials and the powers that be who would like very much to do away with the age of consent for minors. And we'll go into the detail of that as well. So I thank you for watching this video. I wish you a good day. I hope that you have found this information helpful. I apologize for the length of time that it took me to get this video up and running. Um, I'm just not very technologically savvy, so I'm doing the best I can. So thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day. I hope you found this helpful, and I hope that you will spread this information so that the general public will understand um, what we're up against. So thanks again. Hope to see you soon.